Okay, we are back for another episode. I just got some pre-workout in me and I've got as much energy as a silverback gorilla. Um, today we're going to be talking about Angela Merkel trees, aka Merkel trees. They're not actually named after her. So let's go ahead and get into that because I want to get myself to the gym. Okay, so Merkel trees, what are they? Merkel trees are really just an algorithm that easily allows you to compute uh, basically a set of differences over two similar sets of records. Um, they do this really quickly and efficiently using basically something known as a hash tree and what this goes ahead and is really useful for are things like a git version control system um, or an anti-entropy process in some sort of leaderless database like Cassandra or DynamoDB and also in blockchain or decentralized currencies. Basically anytime you need to calculate the difference between two things and ultimately attempt to rectify them by sending some changes over a network, a Merkle tree is extremely useful for allowing you to calculate the smallest unit of difference between two, uh, two sets of records. So let's look at uh, the basic algorithm for a Merkle tree. So we have these four files here, A, B, C, and D. And the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and calculate some hashes for them. And these are going to be the leaf nodes in our tree. So I'm going to put these leaf nodes down here. And now every single parent node of any node is going to basically incorporate the two hashes into its own hash and go ahead and use that. So basically to get the hashes of the parent node, I would say concatenate those two strings of each child node and then go ahead and take the hash of that. We would do the same thing all the way up to the root. Now imagine I wanted to make a change to one of the files, so I'm going to change c.txt. So you can see that the hash of c.txt has changed, thus changing that leaf node, thus changing the parent node, and ultimately changing the root. So now, after I make that change, if I want to go ahead and compare the previous Merkle tree with the current Merkle tree to kind of see what file actually changed, I would do the following. I would go ahead and look at these two. I would say, okay, well, the root's different, so I know that I have a difference between them somewhere. I'm going to have to traverse that. Then I would say, okay, the right node, or the right child of the root is different, so I'm going to have to traverse the right path. And then ultimately, that child of 93PQ versus 4W12 is different, and so that's where the, the differences lie between the two. And so, you know, if I wanted to kind of propagate that change over the network, now as opposed to having to propagate every single file, and go ahead and do um, this kind of naive implementation where we waste a ton of network bandwidth, I can only go ahead and um, propagate the change file. And even still, there are optimizations to ma uh, be made even beyond that where you basically only um, propagate the differences of the file, and that's kind of what Git does where you, know, you have the original file, but then Git calculates the diffs, and then the diffs are propagated over the network, but you use the Merkle tree to actually go ahead and calculate where the diffs are in the first place. Okay, so how do Merkle trees actually work in Git? Well, it's a little bit different than what I just showed in the sense that Git is a versioning system, which means that we want to be able to look at old commits as well, as opposed to just seeing the updated Merkle tree of any state, because it's important to be able to kind of go back in time. So in order to do this, what we actually do is every single file that gets changed almost gets treated like its own file, and we go ahead and take the hash of it. So if the hash is in the Merkle tree, even if it's under a different name, like um, it has some different metadata, we just go ahead and don't change anything, and you know that's efficient. But if there is a new hash, then what we go ahead and do is instead of modifying the old hash that it corresponds to, we go ahead and add it as a leaf to the Merkle tree, and then create this entirely new branch of that Merkle tree, and ultimately go up and propagate those changes all the way to the root. However, the new root that we're creating and all those new uh, intermediate nodes that we're creating are all going to be copies. We're not actually modifying the old Merkle tree. And what that means is that if we're to use an old pointer to a root uh, representing an old commit, we can still go ahead and access those old hashes to the files and go ahead and retrieve the prior versions of those files. Okay, um, in Cassandra, we have anti-entropy. So Merkle trees are really useful for basically going ahead and determining the differences between two replicas. As a result, determining you know the basically the smallest unit of change that can be sent over the network, and then doing so in order to ensure that they are eventually consistent with one another. However, if you think about this for a second, there's a little bit of an issue. Isn't the data actually always going to be changing? So as a result, you might go ahead and perform anti-entropy, and by the time the data gets there, it's already stale. So 
that could be the case. However, Cassandra actually does this um, anti-entropy process not on the raw data itself, not on the keys and values, but instead on those immutable SS table files that are part of Cassandra's LSM tree-based architecture. So this is something known as incremental read repair. Basically, Cassandra uses immutable SS table files, and as a result, if two replicas have kind of these similar SS table files, and they have yet to be repaired, we can basically just go ahead and repair an SS table file once. Because we know that once all of those replicas have agreed on the SS table file, um, the fact that it's immutable means there will be no further changes to it, and as a result, we're not going to have to perform anti-entropy multiple times per the SS table. So as a result, we can start marking off all of these SS tables as repaired, and then once they've been repaired, we can go ahead and compact them in the background because we're going to get you know, consistency between all of these replicas. So instead, what we actually do is, instead of sending an entire Merkle tree that represents the contents of every single SS table, we do this incremental read repair where we're sending these smaller Merkle trees over the network, only representing the contents of these unrepaired SS tables. And as a result of that, we've lowered the overhead and the, the, the network bandwidth and I.O. that needs to be used. So this makes everything more efficient. Another thing that has to happen here as a result of having these two types of SS tables, both unrepaired and repaired, is the compaction process between them kind of needs to be separated. For example, if we have a bunch of repaired SS tables, and then we were to go ahead and kind of perform log compaction and merge those in with a bunch of unre unrepaired SS tables, well, then we would have all these keys uh, mixed into our previously repaired SS table that now perhaps may not be valid. So now we're going to have to perform, compa uh, sorry, not compaction, but rather anti-entropy all over again on something that we've already performed anti-entropy on. So the way that Cassandra tries to mitigate this problem, which is pretty smart, is that it has two types of compaction. Basically, you can compact um, unrepaired SS tables with one another, and you can compact repaired SS tables with one another. And by doing this, we make sure that we're never performing um, duplicate anti-entropy by making sure that basically once an SS table has been repaired, that data is never going to be sent in a Merkle tree over the network again. Okay, so in conclusion, Merkle trees are a really cool way of detecting the differences between two sets of records using a hash tree. So obviously we can kind of detect those uh, differences in logarithmic time by basically just going ahead and traversing down the tree. Once we've figured out those differences, it allows us to kind of send that minimal unit of, you know, file diffs over the network, and it greatly makes things a lot more efficient. Um, we can see these come up in a decent amount of system design problems, such as, um, you know, Git reversion control systems, and in addition, anti-entropy or blockchain. Even though I'm not going to talk about the applications of Merkle trees in blockchain at the moment, I am planning on doing some sort of blockchain or DeFi video in the future and hopefully we'll be able to kind of see how Merkle trees come into play then. All right, guys, I hope this one was useful, and uh, I'm going to get myself to the gym. So have a